change is hard. It's hard for many reasons, but one of the key, if you want to call it physiological reasons, is that your habits, good or bad, are already hardwired into your brain. See, we have an agreement here. Tell you a story about a, a gentleman that I was coaching, an investment banker. Let's call him Eddie Money. And Eddie Money was really not happy because he was feeling great stress. He felt like he had no control over his schedule, that his boss had control over it, his, his family, his clients, his colleagues. And so he started feeling like a victim, he started being really pent up. And then you combine that with that he actually had a short temper. Not a good combination. High stress, short temper, and on occasion he would explode. He's the kind of guy you would see yelling at the taxi driver. Or the guy who's swearing at people in the office. So Eddie Money knew that he had a problem. Eddie knew that he had to make some change. He had to stop becoming or feeling like a victim, and he had to start taking control. Now, change is hard. There's a lot of reasons why people don't do what they know they should. There's a lot of reasons why people don't do what they want to do. And if you look at some of these reasons, anything that you see in common, they're all negative. Oh, I don't have enough time. Oh, I don't have control. Oh, I don't know what the future is. Oh, that's too risky. I feel like a victim. And when you feel like a victim, what happens is you start activating the right prefrontal cortex of your brain. This is where negative emotions are, when you're frustrated, when you're irritated, when you're unhappy, when you're angry, when you feel like a victim and you have no control. This part of the brain goes into overdrive, and it tells the body to secrete stress hormones throughout. This is why your blood pressure rises. This is why you, uh, uh, your temperature goes up. This is why you have a hard time even thinking and processing because you feel like a victim. The key is to be able to get control, and that is to get the activity moving from the right to the left prefrontal cortex where positive emotions are. So that's what I would like to talk about, how to get that shift. Aristotle says, we are what we repeatedly do, and so, so true. Because if you think about the brain, the brain is a jungle of neurons. We have over 100 billion neurons in just one brain. And these neurons are competing to make uh, connections, and there are over 100 trillion connections. And these connections are made stronger or weaker according to use. The more you use it, the stronger it gets. And so our hardwiring or these connections dictate how we feel, how we act, our passions, our strengths, our weaknesses, our good habits, our bad habits. They're all in there. Now the good news is that there are windows of opportunity. There are times in your life when your brain is very supple, it's very flexible, and it can it's very, very highly receptive to input. The bad news is those windows of opportunity are gone for you. You're already past those. But there is hope because there's plasticity. Plasticity means that the brain learns. The brain develops, generates new neurons, creates new, correct, uh, new connections. But to create these, con these connections, you need repetition. You need repetition. So what you want to do is try to do this new thing, this new habit, this new behavior over and over and over for about 30 to 60 days. It's this acquisition period. And if you can force yourself to do this new thing 30 to 60 days, it starts rewiring. And you start developing a new habit. So how can you do something over and over? The best strategy is 
take small steps and do them over and over. Because change requires moving beyond our comfort zone. It's best initiated in small and manageable increments. Small steps are good for a lot of reasons. One, they're easy to take. You can take them right now. They're very clear. And when you take one step and then the next step and then the next step, they start adding up to have great progress. And the nice thing is once you start taking these steps, you actually start feeling like you're in control. You start shifting from a victim to more like, hey, I can do something about my life. Let me talk about a big three consultant that I was uh, working with, and let's, let's see, consultant, let's call her consul Consuela, okay? Consuela had a big idea. Her big idea was, I'm quitting. And I asked Consuela, why are you quitting? She says, well, my work-life balance is a disaster, so I need to quit. So after a lot of talking, we started trying to identify what are the, what are the things that are causing her work-life balance. And what we discovered, there's one key thing that was creating a big problem. And it was that as a consultant, you usually have to leave Sunday night so that you can be at the client on Monday morning at 9. And she's a mother, she's a wife. It's really difficult when you have to leave on Sunday ruin your weekend, and it was creating a big problem for her. So I asked her, well, have you ever talked to your client and asked them, is it okay if we arrive at noon on Monday? And the time that we miss, we will make up a Monday night or Tuesday night or Wednesday night. You will not see a drop-off at all in the results. And you know what the client said? Okay. So she stopped flying out on Sunday night. Now, does this or did this completely solve her work-life balance? Of course not. But that small step had a significant impact in her life. So small steps do add up. Now, when people are trying to look for change, they have a tendency to try to look at black or white, 100% or 0%, but the reality is life is lived in the gray. It's somewhere between 0 and 100. Let's say, well, I think most of, a lot of you are students, let's say you study too much. Some of you might study too much. And you might th be thinking, well, I, you know, I got to stop doing this. I got to have a life. So I would rather study only 12 hours a week. Now, that's probably not very realistic, and it's probably not very practical, and it's probably not very smart. <laughs> so you figure out there's nothing I can do. Well, what if you were able to take those 24 hours and just change it to, to 20? Doesn't solve your problem completely, but you know what? That's a 16% improvement. Let's say you exercise one day a week and you want to be like a great athlete, so you want to exercise every single day. But you know that's going to be very, very difficult. So what if instead, I know this is not ideal, instead of one day you decide to do two days? 100%. Improvement. Improvement. Calories, you want to go from 4,000 a day to 3,000 a day. That's a 25% improvement. Small steps really make a difference. So when we're trying to pick goals, we have a tendency to pick very distant and big goals, like I want to lose 30 pounds. Big goal. Here's what we suggest, is that you create big goals for direction and small goals for action. So that big goal would be, one year from now, in 2017, I want to be 30 pounds lighter. It's a great goal. But in order to get there, you need to create a small one, such as I'm going to lose one pound this week. One pound. Okay? Oh, another big goal could be, let's say you want to run a 5K race, but you don't run. So you can't immediately put on your, your shoes and go running 5K. You'll kill yourself. 
So maybe your long-term goal is maybe next month I will sign up for a 5K race and today I'm going to run a half a kilometer. <laughs> Small goals. Okay, I'm going to share with you a technique. It's called MBTA. Now, uh, as you know, I, I'm an executive coach. And as an executive coach, I get to work with McKinsey people, you know, IBM, Lenovo. I work with the CEOs and managing partners, and I charge them a lot of money. And this technique we share with just about every single executive that I work with. And you know what? I'm going to share it with you for free. Yes. <laughs> But after you hear it, you'll probably say, wow, that's simple. I can't believe they pay you for this. But it's true, it is simple. It's incredibly simple. And what you'll find is that really the simple things in life are, are the things that really will make a difference. Okay, like small steps, simple. So MBTA, M stands for motivation. Motivation is the foundation for change. If you want to create a new habit or break an old habit and you kind of want it, forget it. Don't even start. You're wasting your time. If you really want to create a new habit, you have to really want it. I mean really want it. So motivation is absolutely critical. Now, our, our investment banker, Eddie, Eddie Money, highly motivated because if he continued to blow up at, at his, people in the office, maybe one day he'll blow up at a client, he obviously felt, this is a problem for my career, I'm going to have a hard time making partner, in fact, I might even get fired, or I might have a heart attack, and so he had tremendous motivation. He had to change. And here's what he thought about is he used to be a runner, but he stopped running because of uh, too much work. But what he realized is he loved running, and when he did run, it was a release, a release of stress. This was a great way for him to release the stress that was constantly building up. And so he put in his mind, okay, I'm motivated, I'm going to fix this, I'm going to start running again. And of course, he picked an objective of, I'm going to run every day. MBTA, the next letter is B, behaviors that are precise. If you want to create a new habit, you need to define this new habit in terms of a very precise behavior. Not precise would be something like, I'll exercise more. Precise would be, let me give you your definition, let me give you my definition of, of exercise. Because I set a target every week of how many times I'll exercise that week. And so I have to define it very, very precisely what counts as an exercise, what does not. So if I run, I have to run a minimum of 3K or 20 minutes. If I run less than 3K, it counts as zero exercises. 2.9K does not count. Precise, 3.0 or up, upwards. When I hike, it's got to be a minimum of one hour. When I do weightlifting, it has to be a minimum of 30 minutes, and I have a regimen of what I have to do in those 30 minutes. I love tennis, so when I play tennis, it's got to be one hour. If I play doubles, two hours. So it's very, very precise. Okay, let's pick another one. Let's say some of you are addicted to gaming. No, right? Some of you might be addicted to gaming and you're thinking, ah, this is a problem, I need to start playing a little bit less. Well, not precise is I'm gonna do less hours of gaming on Sunday. Very not precise. <laughs> Precise would be, okay, if I'm going to reduce my hours on Sunday, I will not allow myself to play before 7 p.m. Very, very precise. Okay. Eddie Money, our investment banker, decided that his definition would be the same as mine. 3K running 
or 20 minutes. Anything less would not count. So he defined it very precisely. Okay? Uh, another reason why precise bit behaviors are so important is we, we will constantly think of reasons not to do something. I know I want to exercise. I set an, uh, a target of three exercises a week. Oh, I'm tired. Oh, I've got a lot of work. Oh, I don't feel good. We're always going to try to get out of it. And so by defining it precisely, it makes it much more difficult. I'm sure you know this guy. This guy says, I'm going to exercise more. And so what does he do? He does 10 crunches. Then he stops and he goes and gets coffee. And maybe 15 minutes later, he comes back, he does 10 push-ups. Then he stops and he goes plays a game for 30 minutes. And then he goes talks to his friend and says, you know what? I exercise a lot. I exercise all the time. I wonder why I'm not losing weight. It's because it's not precise. What you want to do is you want to say that you did something when you actually did it. To say something when you actually did it. So let's say you desire to exercise. Well, maybe or not precise is exercise more. Precise is 100 crunches, 100 push-ups. Maybe you want to study less. You can't say, I'm going to reduce on Sunday. You say, not before 7 p.m. on Sunday. Maybe you want to become a better public speaker. Not precise would be, I'll do it more often. Precise would be, I will do one speech or lead one meeting every month. Maybe you want to increase the relationship with your professor. Not precise is talk to him more. No, it's ask one question in every class. Or I'm going to meet with him once a month outside of class. Precision. T, timing that's specific. Okay, now you're motivated. You have a precise behavior. You need to have timing that's specific. That means you need to be able to write it in a calendar. You cannot write as soon as possible in a calendar. You cannot write sometime next week in a calendar. You can't say, I'll do it more in a calendar. So for example, Monday, November 9th, you can write that in a calendar. Even better is November 9th at 7 p.m. Very specific. Or 7.10 p.m., even better. Okay, on top of that, you also have to have a contingency. Just in case for some reason that you schedule something at 7.10 on Monday night, and for some reason maybe you've got a class you have to take or you have to fly out, you can't do it. Well, then you, have a, have a, you need to have a contingency that says, okay, I'll do it on Tuesday at 7.10. Okay? So our, our investment banker, Eddie Money, what he decided to do was to specifically time it that he would run on the weekends at 9 a.m. and he would run on the weekdays at 7 a.m. And he could write it in the calendar, 7 a.m. Monday, run. Saturday, 9 a.m., run. Okay, with me so far? All right, here's the, here's the tough one, or actually it's an easy one. MBTA, now we're on A achievable. This is probably going to be the first time in your life that somebody will ask you to set the bar low. I want you, when you're trying to create a new habit, I want you to set a target so incredibly low. Because your mindset cannot be, I will do my best. If your mindset is, I will do my best, forget it. Don't even start. Your mindset must be, I will do it absolutely no matter what. I will do it absolutely no matter what. That's why you got to set it low. Because if you set it at, I'm going to run seven days a week, the first week you run seven days, the next week you run five days, the third week you run zero. Fourth week, zero, 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 zero. You're actually better off setting it incredibly low. Maybe one. 
Now, of course, we know running or exercising once a week is not really that great. But this is not the point. The point is you've got to create a habit. So if you can set it low and you force yourself to do it every Monday at 7 a.m. next week, write in a calendar, Monday, 7 a.m. run. Next week, Monday, 7 a.m. And you force yourself to do it Monday after Monday after Monday after Monday after about four, five, six weeks, you actually won't have to write it in your calendar anymore. It'll just start rewiring. Okay, so our investment banker, Eddie, decided that he was going to do one weekday, which was Monday at 7 a.m. He'd do one weekend, Saturday at 9 a.m. The contingency, if he was traveling on Monday morning, he'd do it on Tuesday. If he couldn't do it on Tuesday, he'd do it on Wednesday. But he had to do one day during the weekday, and he would have to do one week, one day during the weekend. Not only that, to show you how precise and how achievable we made it, we, I said, Eddie, what happens if it's a holiday? And he said, no, if it's a holiday, I, I don't need to run. I said, okay. What's your definition of a holiday? Is it one day? Is it two days? Is it five days? And what he decided would be three. <laughs> so if the holiday had three or more days that week, he did not have to run. But if it had two or less, he had to run. So it's incredibly precise, very, very specific, and incredibly achievable. I saw him about six months later, and he had lost a lot of weight. And he was telling me the story. You know, at first it was really hard. I, that first day, I, I didn't want to run, and I almost didn't. But I made myself do it. And then the next week, ooh, it was hard, but it was a little bit easier. And then the next week, it got easier. And the next week, it started becoming a habit. And instead of wanting, running one day a week, he's now running four to five, even with his busy schedule. Okay? So here's another example. Let's say you're motivated to be a better father or mother because you don't, you're never home for dinner. Well, your behavior could be go home for dinner. And it could be specific timing at 6 p.m. And you could say, well, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. I would challenge that, though. Is it achievable? You probably should pick one day. Or let's say... You want to look and feel healthy. So the behavior might be a really small step. It's not cut a 1,000 calories out of your diet. It's cut bread out. In fact, let's make it even easier. Only one meal a, week, a day. I'm going to cut it out of breakfast and make it even more achievable. Maybe when you're eating at home, you won't have bread. It, I, again, it may not sound like a lot, but that's not the point. The point is, is that because you make yourself do it, you start rewiring. And then you can cut bread out three meals, seven meals, cut bread out completely and not even miss it. And one more. Let's say you want to be a more engaging speaker. The behavior could be I'm going to use the um counter to stop saying um. We work with a lot of executives on on presentation, and many people have what we call a crutch. Some people have the um crutch. Hello, um, my name is Lance, um, Tanaka, um, I work for Asia, um, executive, um, resource, limited, um. I know you're laughing, but some of you, if I get you up here, you, you might have that. So a precise behavior is make them count. Every time you hear yourself say, um, just count. Hello, my name is Lance, um, one. Tanaka, I, um, two. Work for Asia Executive, um, three. Resource. By the end of the day, you'll have 572. It's okay, because if you do it the next day, it'll be 275. You do it the third day, 112. Fourth day, 52. Fifth day, 10. Works incredibly well. So let's say for this person, they're going to make the timing to do it in every presentation uh, and every meeting. Again, 
not really so achievable. So maybe instead we'd say, every day just choose one situation. You're going to walk into one meeting today, count ums for that meeting. Tomorrow, pick another event. Maybe it's a presentation. Count your ums. The next day, it's another meeting. Count your ums. It takes a little bit longer, but if you do this day after day after day, again, around 30 days later, they go away. So it's a wonderful technique to use. So don't crack under the pressure. You got lots of reasons or excuses why you can't do things. Take control. MBTA. Be motivated. Behaviors that are precise. Timing that's specific. Very achievable. Set that bar really low and force yourself to do it day after day after day after day. And then in a very short uh, period of time, it'll be a new habit. And you will take control. So make a change. Thank you.